How large was Auschwitz? How vast, both geographically and figuratively, we understand the words of Auschwitz-Birkenau today. The German Nazis started the Kampf immediately after they took this part of southern Poland. This part of southern Poland of former, well, eastern Silesia or upper Silesia was almost immediately included into the Third Reich in October of 1939 and uh, the plan was obvious from the very beginning. It needs to be redeveloped, it needs to be invested into and at first this was not necessarily Wehrmacht or SS investing their money. There were dozens of German companies. The companies we know today which were investing their money in this region with uh, hope for profit. Uh, such was the case in the place we are standing. We are in Auschwitz, although we are 14 kilometers north of Auschwitz proper as we know it. In September of 1943, it was known as Auschwitz Furstengrube, one of the largest out of 48 of German Nazi satellite camps of Auschwitz. Uh, the camp of Furstengrube was uh, accommodating in 1944 at the peak of its development uh, around 1,200 of inmates, mostly Jews, from various countries of Europe. We are right now standing on the very outskirts of a camp which was built specifically to hold the inmates of Auschwitz. This camp was built by inmates themselves. You can see the corner, the relatively solid brick fencing. On the topping of this brick fencing, you can see this very characteristic concrete band pillars. On each of the four corners of the camp, there were four pretty tall watchtowers that uh, German Nazis built in order to supervise those inmates here. So, being 14 kilometers from Auschwitz as we know it, we are still in Auschwitz. But, we can go another 50, 60 kilometers west of here, as far as, for example, Gliwice, and we would still be in Auschwitz. You need to remember that in this relatively short time period from the camp establishment in spring of 1940 till the camp of liberation in January of 45, the German Nazis, but not necessarily the Nazis only, the German industry in search for profit established one of the largest system of exploitation of slave labor force that was known to humanity. In late of 1944, when the camp is about to be liberated, the camp of Auschwitz, the larger camp of Auschwitz, is holding close to 130, 140,000 of inmates who are still alive just for one reason. They are an economic asset. They are representing a slave labor force for either the private enterprises in the vicinity of Auschwitz or for the SS itself, which at certain point is starting to consolidate its labor force for its own purposes.
In July of 1943, the management of uh, IG Fahrbahn is inviting the commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hoess, into the territory for an inspection. This is the decision about establishment of Auschwitz Fürstengrube. The first inmates are coming in September 1943. The commandant is becoming the known Auschwitz Sadis Otto Moll, a later person responsible for the operation of gas chambers and crematoriums of Birkenau. All of those inmates are building the new and operating the old Fürstengrube coal mine in the vicinity of the camps. But there is also Lager Sud existing earlier for the Italian and Ukrainian women, Lager Valdek with a couple of hundreds of Soviet prisoners of war. There's also Lager Nord with Polish, Greek, Belgium, French prisoners. And somewhere in the middle of this human exploitation misery, there is a forest cemetery for the regular burials of those who are falling victims of industrial exploitation in Fürstengrube. We are about half a mile north of auschwitz furstengrube in a forest. It's a very surreal place. It was organized first as a cemetery in 1941 to bury all of those compulsory workers that were dying in performing the slave labor force for German industry in this part of Silesia. So mostly from Camp Waldeck, Camp Nord and Camp South. Then when Fürstengrube as a part of Auschwitz was established, it became also a place of burial of some of the inmates that died during the slave labor in the Fürstengrube mine. Officially, those who died within the camp were stored in the morgue and then their corpses were being taken 14 kilometers south into the crematoriums of Birkenau but we do know that there were a lot of corpses buried here in this very cemetery because local peasants were forced into transportation of corpses almost daily. We know today that the mortality in Furstengrube, only in Furstengrube Auschwitz, was about two free people a day, from September 43 till January 45. But later on, under the communist administration, this part of Poland remained within a large system of labor camps. So uh, there were a lot of local Silesia population, Germans, POWs, that were stationed and imprisoned in Kampfustengrube and worked in the coal mines. Their cemetery was organized on top of those that were buried within 40s. Life, slave labor and death in Furstengrube is described in a large number of testimonies and relations which were collected right after the war. Some of them as early as 1945-46 by the prosecutors who are collecting data for the trials of the camp commandant Rudolf Hess. We have a couple of testimonies collected by the Polish head prosecutor Jan Zen interviewing the survivors of Furstengrube. But also, there are many testimonies collected by the workers of the later established State Museum Auschwitz-Birkenau, who were trying to collect as much data and evidence from not only inmates, but also local population who witnessed those atrocities. 
Let us get to the relation of a French Jewish prisoner, a musician himself, by the name of Felix Stahl, in which he's trying to describe the labor conditions in such camps. In the camps where there were coal mines, the work was very hard. It was the worst kind of work I can imagine. Prisoners worked in three shifts, eight hours each. It was very wet in the pits and the footwear of the prisoners was often torn to pieces and many of them had to walk with wet feet with resulting serious sicknesses. Many of the pits were only 70 centimeters high so that the prisoners had to walk lying on their stomachs and kneeling. Eight hours in such a posture with hardly any interval and the blows beside them made themselves felt. We were slaves. The coal shovel was at least four times as big as a normal shovel. Many prisoners lost their lives by being buried under collapsing passages or by having their heads crushed by falling lamps or coal and debris. Naturally, the men had to wash themselves and return from the mines. This was no pleasure, since even in the extreme cold the men had to undress out of the doors and then await their turn. Only a few of them had towels. Thus the majority had to run, shivering and wet, back to the barracks. Frequently the prisoners, upon their return, tired and hungry, as they were, had first to engage in half an hour's sport, perhaps merely for not having sung efficiently loudly while marching campwards. We're standing in a, here at the very important border. It's a border in between a concentration camp behind us and a death camp in front of us. So we may actually make a statement that uh, it's a border of a certain German Nazi planning mistake in setting up Auschwitz. A mistake of self-incriminating themselves, conducting the mass extermination in the crematoriums and gas chambers in the back of Birkenau in the full visibility of dozens of thousands of inmates that are performing labor on a daily basis. Of course, the perpetrators are absolutely not anticipating that some of those people may survive, that some of those people may become the witnesses. In the German Nazi planning of this place, they are building the eternal Third Reich, so they are planning to be here forever. The camp is built very solid. They are using the best construction materials they can specifically for the construction of the crematoriums and gas chambers which were in the back part of Birkenau. Somewhere behind us is the ruin of crematorium gas chamber number three. The largest piece of technology that humanity ever invented and built for the sake of mass extermination of human beings. A piece of technology which was used from spring of 1943 into the late of 1944 to mass exterminate the European Jewish community. But we are exactly in the place where the hospital building was located. And as we are here on the anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz, uh, this place is important for the moment of liberation. We know that the camp was evacuated, just like all of the other camps of Auschwitz complex, in uh, mid-January of 1945. This meant 
about uh, eight to nine thousands of inmates being marched towards Glivice. So they were marching for about 45 kilometers in a critical winter January conditions. Then in Glivice, they were put into open air freight cars and taken into a long journey into Mauthausen. Those who survived, and we're estimating about 25% of those pushed into the death marches, would not were liberated only a couple of months later. Yes, ironically, the liberation of Auschwitz of the 27th of January 45 did not mean freedom for most of the Auschwitz inmates. On the contrary, over 50,000 of them were organized in marching columns. In case of here, Fürstengrube, we get personal accounts of the nearby villages and inhabitants who give us specific descriptions. The inmates were put into a roll call square inside of Fürstengrube, and then a line of inmates of four in a row was created. We have accounts of the inmates in the external row having their hands tied with a rope into a kind of a long stick making an external barrier so that the inmates are not running. And in such a mode, they are being taken walking into Glivice, 45 kilometers walk. But there were also those inmates who stayed behind. There were also those inmates who stayed within the camp of Fürstengrube, and they stayed here. They stayed here in the hospital barrack. About 250 men, mostly Jews, Quite a lot of them from the transport arriving in October of 1944 from Theresienstadt. Among them, Gideon Klein and Schorsch. So there's 250 men that were left in the hospital barrack. They were too terrified to leave the camp fences. They were trying to organize some kind of a camp life in the critical winter conditions. And then... On the 27th of January 1945, the official date of liberation of Auschwitz, there was a Wehrmacht unit that was operating behind the evacuation line. This Wehrmacht unit was actually sent to Birkenau with a specific task to explode the crematoriums and gas chambers, or the empty shells of the buildings of crematoriums, gas chambers number 2, 3, 4, and 5. As this unit was obviously evacuating direction west on the 27th, because they've exploded the last crematorium on the 26th of January, as this unit was retreating west, they must have went through here, through Furstengrube. They encountered those 250 men in a barrack, and they've organized a massacre here. We have a lot of accounts of the local population of what had happened, we know that the camp of Fürstengrube was surrounded with a kind of a military cordon and the building of hospital was set on fire. We also have accounts of the Wehrmacht soldiers shooting at those who were trying to escape. This is the way how Gideon Klein and 200 other men would die on the 27th of January of 1914.